everyone, a very warm welcome to this week's Friday's Live. My name is Rose Savely Wadden. I am Newspaper Licensing Manager here at Find My Pass, and we're delighted uh, to have you joining us today. So let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, we've got the lovely um, Jen in the comments today. Um, so please do say hello to Jen. Just see a couple of people joining already. We've got Roz from a hot and sunny Massachusetts, Gillian from Edinburgh, uh, Andrew, it's warm and sunny a week here in Lancashire. I wish I could say the same about London. London has not had the best weather, which is which is rare, but we, we've got sunshine today. Um, I've, I've got 17 degrees here, so says my uh, computer. Uh, so who else we've got? We've got Anya, uh, Alvina from Canada, Glenda. Uh, Andrea's tuning in from a sunny soak in Trent. Uh, sunny in Lincolnshire with Gina. Hello, everybody. It's lovely, lovely to see you. Um, Ellen, it's 28 degrees in Roscoe already <laughs> in the morning. Um, Jenny from Western Supermare. Oh, it's really great to see you all uh, today. And it sounds like we've got widespread sunshine. Wonderful stuff. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've got a packed session for you today, as ever. And um, we're going to go through our wonderful new records of the week. And then we're going to be exploring something slightly different. We're going to be looking at pet history. Bear with me on this. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. So let, let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at that later. Um, yeah, oh, we've got the Londoners in, um, Karen from our sunny, hot North London. We've got the sunshine now, don't we? And and Karen Jones in South London. Um, gosh, yes, lots of people in today. Carol in uh, New York, but born in County Durham. I'm going to be talking about Durham in a little bit later. Um, we've got Lynn, we've got Janet. Oh, it's so lovely to see you all. Um, so I'm just going to uh, do our question of the week, and we will come back to this. Um, so the question of the week is have you come across any stories about pets or animals in your family history research? So that's, have you come across any stories about pets or animals in your family history research? Um, we're going to come back to that. We're, we're going to go through uh, the new records of the week first uh, to give you some time uh, to, to answer that question. And I'm going to bring up our, our, our menu of new records of the week. Let me just do that. We've got a, a nice a nice collection. And oh, yeah. And thank you, Jen, um, to put the question in the chat there for us. Um, so we've got a new British school and university record this week as well as new records for our um, Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Southwark. So the new baptism, marriages and congregational uh, records. Uh, so let, let's let's uh, let's dive in and I'm, I'm with the Southwark ones I'm quite excited because my, my previous role um, at Find My Past was actually digitization manager and I worked on this project so it's always nice to see um, everything come full circle. Hello, everybody. Just thinking, who else is joining? We've got Daphne, we've got Victoria, we've got Heather, um, and oh, Andrew is still going through last week's Manchester Rate Books editions. There's a lot to get. There's a lot to get through there. Okay, and um, we're going to start with the um, school and university student records. Now, these actually span quite an incredible time frame. We're looking 1264 all the way through to 12. Uh, 1926 even, 1264 to 1926. So a huge um, time frame there. So you've basically got 700 years of history. And these records have been taken from um, digitized copies of school and uh, register books, uh, which have been published at various different times for various different purposes. So you will see some variation of the original record here. This is a great collection. We've got images for it. So do check those original images. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of different formats all, all gathered together here in this collection. So, as I said, these, these are taken from um, schools and um, universities. So you've got sort of famous public schools like Eton and Harrow, uh, Charterhouse, Repton. Also some lesser known schools are there as well. Um, and also uh, records from Oxford and Cambridge universities. So looking at um, Keble College, um, Exeter College in Oxford and King's College in um, Cambridge. Um, and yeah, in all, we've got over... 150,000 um, new records. And Arnie's already spotted some interest here. Um, still trying to find one of my ancestors who said he studied at An Andrews, um, but they have no record of him. Right. So um, 
let's take a look at some of these records. Um, so this is the um, transcript for one, Frederick, uh, hum Frederick Richard Humphrey Bird, who attended Durham School. Um, I said, so we've got, we've got um, uh, an, an, uh, uh, sorry, my words. I think we said we've got someone on the chat here who, who was born in County Durham. So this is the, the Durham connection. Um, so uh, Durham School is pictured there. And this transcript, it, um, it, you know, we've got uh, Frederick's uh, year that he he was born and uh, the year that he left in 1899. But as I said, it's always worth um, checking the image. There's, there's so much detail there. Now, we learned that um, he was born in 1885, Frederick, and that he was the son of H. Bird of Stockton upon Tees. And uh, we learned that he left in December 1899, so he was about 14 when he left. We also learn about Frederick's business, that he was in, um, he was working in Stockton-upon-Tees, so, so not far away from Durham at all. And sadly, um, he, he, he died young in March 1906. So what I really like about this collection is the ex extra information. So not only do we know that Frederick went to Durham School, but we also know what happened to him afterwards, you know, what he worked at and when he died. Um, and then whilst we've poor Frederick passed away, for those alumni who are still alive, you actually find their current addresses, which is so useful. And again, we're sort of, you know, we're in between census years again. So if you, if you had that, if you have that elusive ancestor that you, you're, you're sort of struggling to track down, this could be useful. This could be really useful. Um, so we've got uh, James, Gordon, James Gordon Callanan. He was the same age as Frederick. And we learned that after attending Durham School, he then went to Durham University, which is actually where I studied too. Um, and then he entered the merchant service. So he's, he's got strong ties to Durham City. He was born there. And we learned that he was um, living at uh, Laburnan Avenue in Durham which is actually very close to where I used to live. So I used to live um, in Holly Street in Durham, which is just, the, there's a collection of streets all named after um, plants. Um, so yeah, I lived around the corner from, from James. <laughs> So, and you can just, yeah, the level of detail here is, is fantastic. Uh, even more below that entry there for James Gordon Callahan, you've got the entry for Victor Francis Carr. He's the son of the British Vice Consul in Colombia. He's the nephew of the Reverend O. Carr. So you've got some great family connections there. And we learn again about his, his work, that he was a fruit importer, and then his address in Blackheath in London. And when I, when I first looked at this collection, I was like, oh, it's just, it's a load of men. <laughs> Where are the women? We have women too. We have women too in, in this collection. So um, for example, um, we have the records here for the Quaker schools in York, including the Mount um, Girls School. Um, so we have the record here of um, Mary Lister, who attended from 1831 through to 1834. And again, you can see the original image there. It differs slightly uh, from that one from Durham School. So it's, it's worth clicking in and having a look and seeing what, what extra information you can glean. So you can see um, her um, original record, um, she's listed with her contemporaries, and you've got some next extra nice details here too. Uh, we see that she marries, she marries uh, one Henry Patterson, and we learn that she's from Bradford, and that she left in 1834. And she's also listed alongside her sister Anne, well I'm assuming it's her sister, she's uh, Mary Lister is li listed alongside Anne Lister. And so we can assume that um, that these two are sisters. So it's a really uh, lovely and rich collection here. Perfect. OK, so moving on to um, our next collection, uh, which are the Southwark Roman Catholic baptisms. Hmm. And these are joining our um, England Roman Catholic collection. And now you might have noticed that we have published uh, Southwark Roman Catholic collections previously, and you might wonder why these new records are joining now. So just to sort of give you that peek behind the scenes of the, the digitization process, lifting that veil, it happens with these projects that sometimes records might be missed, um, especially true in a project like this one, where what we did was actually go out to, to each individual church to collect registers. So it's a huge project and, you know, sometimes things get missed, but we never want to miss anything. So we come back later and we digitise any gaps that we might find and then add them into the collection. So these extra records are from the parishes of Our Lady of Sorrows in um, Peckham and, and uh, St. Joseph in, Ro in Roehampton. So we're, we're looking at the southeast of London and the southwest of London here. So uh, we have nearly um, 
uh, 10,000 new records joining the uh, Southwark Roman Catholic Baptism this, this week. And you can see an example of a transcript here, and it's the baptism for Eva May Langley Appleford. And you can see that the transcript is, is really detailed. The birth date, the baptism date, um, it tells you the parish. So in this case, it's St. Joseph uh, Roehampton, the deanery of, of Mortlake, and um, the name of her father, uh, Johannes Gulumi Appleford, and her mother, Maria Stroud. And what you will notice with these particular records that they are mostly in Latin. So these English names have then been Latinized. Um, uh, so um, Eva's father is, is John William and her mother is Mary. So if in doubt, um, there are plenty of um, lists online that, that convert um, Latin names um, into English ones. And um, the collection page, I think Jen has the link, um, contains some really useful hints for, for working with those Latin terms there. So now let's have a look at the, um, the, uh, the original transcript here, which you can see at the top. And this is where <laughs> Latin comes in really useful. And my Latin is rusty, uh, if non-existent. I actually, I only attended one Latin class at school and Given my current profession, my you know, I, I really should have I really should have um, gone to more Latin classes. Anyway, so um, one thing I should have mentioned is that our Southern Roman Catholic uh, records here they all come with images. So again, it's always a good idea to consult those uh, original images. Um, so the the uh, we can see the image at the top there, um, and this is the transcript for Eva Appleford's baptism. So the curious thing about this particular record is her date of birth and the date of baptism. So you can see uh, at the top just about that she was born in 1873, but she wasn't baptised until 1902. So nearly 30 years have gone past. So this is an adult baptism. And it's always worth looking at, at, at the image, we see that the priest has actually made an annotation there uh, in the margin. Um, and I'm, it says, um, subconditione ab harise conversa. Apologies for uh, butchering the Latin, uh, but it translates as um, under condition of being um, converted from heresy. Um, so the heresy here is uh, the, the religion that uh, the denomination that Eve was uh, previously a part of. Um, so Eva is, is a convert here. She, she is converted to Roman Catholicism and she is now being baptised into that faith. Uh, and, and looking at uh, our Yorkshire baptisms collection, I actually found um, Eva's first baptism, so her, her infant baptism, and she was baptised on the 19th of June 1873 at the Cathedral Church of uh, Sheffield. So this was a Church of England baptism, so she's, she's changed um, denominations, and uh, her parents' names are listed again here, and no, her father's profession. I've, I've, I've put the um, yellow pen over there, but it's just there. The uh, it's curate of the parish. So um, Eva is actually a vicar's daughter, a Church of England vicar's daughter, who has converted to Roman Catholicism. So I'm not sure um, her, her father would have been very happy about that. Um, so interesting there. Um, and actually, what I did notice going through these. Um, uh, these these records is the amount of um, adult uh, baptisms and, um, and and Andrew you know has pointed out um, probably a marriage soon after exactly so quite often you will find that um, people have converted later on in life uh, to then marry someone who who was a Roman Catholic. And we've also got some marriages <laughs> prescient uh, there. Um, so these ones are, um, again, from Southwark. They are from the same parishes. So this is Peckham and Roehampton. They span the years 1882 to, to 1913. And um, I've just pulled out an example here, um, marriage of Robert Lane to Margaret Marshall. And the thing about these marriages, there's a, a lot to digest when, when you look at the original image. There are just so many names here. And um, that that name at the top it, it threw me because I thought oh, I'm looking for um I'm looking for Robert and Margaret and I'm seeing this this completely different name uh, this Leonardus and who is this 
that's the priest. So it's, you know, this is saying, I, the priest, priest names uh, have married um, Robert um, and Margaret. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot to, um, a lot of lot of names in this particular record. We've got the bride and groom's names, uh, their father's names, and then also the witnesses. Um, so yeah, really lovely and um, name rich. And just don't, don't, don't be scared of the Latin, because I was I always get a bit thrown with the Latin, but um, I think once once you get used to it, you kind of you kind of get into that into that flow. And there there is then um, some good advice on the record collection pages just just to help you um, uh, navigate that. And we're on to congregational records, and these are uh, there are over just over one thousand new records joining just the um, the parish of St Joseph in Roehampton, and these span the years eighteen seventy one to nineteen thirteen. So these congregational records they are confirmation records, um, and yeah, there's um, there's, there's uh, a good range here, and you can see I've just pulled out a picture of um, Roehampton Roehampton Sports Club. I think it's quite a famous uh, uh, local location there. Um, and actually, um, I have ties to Roehampton. My my great grandfather and my grandmother lived in Roehampton Vale. They're there in the 1939 census. They wouldn't have been in this collection, um, sadly, as they were Baptists. Um, but let, let's um, let's have a look at an example of one of these congregational records. Um, so this is for Violet, Violet Eyre. You see um, the transcription there on the left-hand side. Um, and she was confirmed on the 29th of June, um, 1912. And Jen makes um, a really good point um, here. Um, congregational records are one of my favourites, filling in the events between baptism, marriage and burial. Because, yeah, is that sort of is that a seminal age, really? You know, you're, you're about... 13 you know sort of coming of age um so it's lovely to sort of see that moment um captured um and yeah there's there's you know this this is again it's really worth um consulting um the images uh you know for for violet we see that her confirmation name is cecilia and we also see the name of her sponsor and also the name of the person who um confirmed that cohort Okay, and just before we move on to the question of the week, which I see everyone has been answering, so I promise we will we'll get to um, all your wonderful answers. I'm really excited uh, to read these. It's slightly different. Um, so yeah, I can, I can see some great answers coming through already. Uh, I just wanted to highlight um, this week's new newspapers, and there's six of them, and they're all from Yorkshire. And we've got um, four Leeds-based newspapers, so that's the Armley and Watley News, uh, the Leeds Evening Express, the South Leeds Echo, and the magnet and uh, they span the years 1862 through to 1898 and they are a really lovely uh, detailed local newspaper so if you're if you have ancestors from, ancestors from that area these could be really useful um, to you and just to highlight the magnet and that's the one in the um the bottom right hand corner it's got that lovely masthead um that's a bit different it's a bit of an unusual one it's uh, a, a title that was devoted to the music hall profession so it was firmly tied to um music halls and musical theater and it actually had a list um, a directory of uh, music halls across the country and the names of the people who were associated with those music halls so if you have um, performing um, arts um, ancestors, which I think, um, oh, yeah, Andrew has. <laughs> this is a slight tie in with the slight tie in with the question of the week. He had a cousin who had a horse riding act in circuses. He, he uh, must have been good. Um, papers are full of ads and reviews nationwide. So you might, you, he, might he might pop up um, in the magnet there. And our two other papers, we have the Bingley Chronicle, so another Yorkshire paper there, and uh, the South Bank, um, the South Bank Express. Uh, so South Bank is on the South Bank of the, the River Tees, just near Middlesbrough. So some lovely um, local um, papers there for you to enjoy. So question of the week, or just a quick reminder, which is, have you come across any stories about pets or animals in your family history research? So, um, some 
uh, Andrea. Um, my ancestor was a kennelman for the Duke of Hamilton of Suffolk. Amazing. So your ancestor, there's, there's that tie to animals in their profession. And I actually hadn't thought about that when I asked this question. So that, that's great. Um, I was, yeah, I was thinking very literally. So I love that. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and Kim, um, a shout out to Armley Wortley, ancestors back there to the mid 1600s. Oh my word. So that paper will be of great use for you. Um, Again, this association with animals, this is something that I, I think I'm going to really draw out um, later when, when I sort of, I've got um, a little guide to, to tracing animals um, in, in our records. It, it tells us a lot about our ancestors and their, their interests, what they loved. And um, so I think this is true of Ellen's here. So she hasn't found any pets, but three times great grand aunt was a noted equestrian and an uncle was a jockey. So it was like, the love of horses um, in your family there. Um, and again, yes, Ginian, um, uh, a few of my ancestors were employed as farmhands, so there was plenty of animals. And I, I guess that would, have been, that would have been true. I've got I've got a lot of ag labs in my family tree. So I guess it would have been quite the norm to be working with animals on their, their day to day. Um, Joe, any plans to digitise the Morley advertiser? Question for us. Let me write that down. Um, I will um, look into that for you. <laughs> um, I will add that to my list. <laughs> um, and oh, we could just blow through. Um, Daphne, the only link to animals I'm aware of is my hobby, who was in the King's Troop and did a lot of Edinburgh military tattoos, as well as looking after some of the late Queen's horses. Oh, wow, that's really remarkable. That's wonderful. Uh, we've got Jean, uh, I have a photo of my grandfather about 1920s with one of the farm horses as a cob that was called Tommy, as my mother had written on the back. That's so special to have that captured, because um, I was sort of thinking about uh, this this question and what I had in my family. And um, I think a couple, of, a couple of sessions ago, I shared a picture of my um, ancestors um, from, from Ivor in, in Berkshire with you. And there was oh, Buckinghamshire, and they, they were photographed with a dog. And that was obviously imp so important for that dog for them to to have that dog in the photograph with them, but sadly didn't have the name on the back. Um, again, yeah, we've got, we've got the connections. Um, Sue Moon, um, no pet mentions, but have a few flymen who must have had and looked after horses. And on your, I remember talking to my gran about her father and said he wouldn't talk about World War One other than talk about the horses that he looked after. And of course, there, there were so many horses killed during during the Great War. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head how many lost their lives um, during during the conflict. But it, it it was it was hundreds of thousands, I think. And I, I don't think I exaggerate there. There's a, such a great loss of life there. Um, Just, I'm just scrolling to the top, <laughs> make sure I've got everybody's answers. And yeah, um, I have a lovely photograph of my great granny with her cat. Um, I'm glad I'm not the first cat lady in our family tree. We're all big animal lovers in our family. Well, from one, one cat lady to another. I don't know if you can see um, the cat bedding behind me. There we go. <laughs> I was trying to get my cat to join us today, but um, you know, he, he's too he's too busy looking out of the window at the birds. Um, and we've got Kim here. Um, we've got lots of stories about pets through my family history, but now they're down to the two below. 1940s, my maternal great aunt and Uncle Winnie and Leonard kept chickens and a goat. One day Winnie went out to hang out some washing when she dropped a couple of pegs. So she went to retrieve them. The goat gave her a bump on her derriere. Oh no, head over heels she went. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the stuff of family, family legend there. Um, and okay, and this this is something um, I think I think Jen might have possibly touched on some um, um, animal pedigrees when we we released the trotting magazine. So that was the, the horse um, the horse newspaper we released a few weeks ago. So William says it's a bit different. He used to have a, a Maine Coon who died last August. I'm sorry, um, but he had his own pedigree family tree. Plus, for animals in the family, lots of relatives kept cats or dogs, but one side of farmers so had a lot of farm animals too. Um, and we've got Jen, 
um, found that one of my Nebraska homesteading ancestors had a pack horse with documented pedigree with French oranges. Ooh la la! How very fancy, Jen. Um, and Karen, um, I found a picture of my maternal grandma with her pet cat when she was about four. I was very close to her, but never knew she had pets. A description on the back of the photo is in her handwriting, and it's just so lovely. I think it's just it just how this our ancestors owning pets I think it's just we learn that extra bit about them and uh, I know I just I think that that's so lovely to have um that sort of photograph um oh birds we haven't mentioned birds yet Anya and my great-grandfather and great-uncle used to breed birds canaries and beautiful small birds I have a newspaper clipping of my great-grandfather winning trophies for his birds and we will come back to animals in newspapers it wouldn't be a Friday's live without me mentioning newspapers um and yet um William going back to um the listers just um in our in the congregational no school records um I wonder I wonder um, if they are connected um, to, to Gentleman Jack and, and Anne List. I did think that. Um, oh, there's some brilliant stories coming through. Thank you, everyone. Janet, Grey Will, my gran grandfather's horse. If they got lost, Grey Will would always find his way home. Oh, my goodness. And there's my grand's cat who liked to let rest on the fire guard. Oof, sounds dangerous. <laughs> um, bath nights were in front of the fire and the cat fell backwards into the tin bath. You can imagine that was quite an unhappy cat. Um, Oz and then pickles and had some family photographs. I love the family photographs. I was home last weekend and any chance to get the the, the old albums out, that, that is me having a look through them. So uh, it's clearly the only photo I've ever seen of my great granddad sat in the garden of his terraced home in Wimbledon with his faithful dog Spider at his side. I know this the dog's name is thankfully his picture was actually labelled a lot of them on and that, that is the struggle, um, not having those labels, but to have the name Spider, I just, I just love that. It's so much um and uh, lynn um two times great grandfather edward lawson worked with horses um for his from his victory it sounded like he was a horse whisperer he also said he worked in stock management which i find he's amazing since he was illiterate by his wife sarah ann talentire was the daughter of a master grocer so probably was literate um and the obituary also said he was held in high regard it's always nice sort of having that ring of ringing endorsement of one's um ancestors um let's see scrolling back um did you not bear with me um uh Okay, maybe some some gremlins, but they seem to be okay. Um, we are still here. No one has pulled the plug. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, as promised, let's um, pull this up. Uh, and oh, good, I'm back. <laughs> Hello, Dad, Daphne. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to um, uncover some pet histories on Find My Past, and this is sort of what was I've sort of been trying to bring out is um in finding out about people's pets you can get even more of a sense of what people were like what your ancestors were like um what they valued um who and what they loved and I, I'm sure you might have seen some of these examples before but I, I wanted to wanted to share them again um and this is um a clipping from the 1921 census it's uh, the entry for the Booth family of um, East Ham. You've got Father Thomas, his wife Maria, and their four children. But what you can just about make out, and there's a little arrow there pointing to it in, in the, the, the right-hand corner uh, at the bottom, is, is a paw print. Um, and I think this, for me, just encapsulates how much of the 1921 census is a, is a snapshot in time. So this is an amazing snapshot here that the cat or a dog has got onto the census, has got onto the form somehow. And you can imagine maybe the uproar in the kitchen, perhaps, or out on the table and the pet scampering across, um, or perhaps, you know, the census was left out overnight and the pet comes by with his grubby paws, um, just giving you a, a real sense of, of that, the sort of the very fabric of that household beyond simply uh, the, the written words. So there are um, a few examples that we, we managed to find during um, 
during our digitization of the 1921 census. Um, and sometimes pets were so important to their families that they were even recorded in the census. So um, it was interesting to, to note that um, some of you were lucky enough to have photographs of your ancestors with the pet and the pet was given a name and just shows how important that was to them. And, you know, nothing has really changed. Um, so, I mean, and, and in the 1921 census search, it's even worth throwing out the word dog or cat or tortoise even um, to have a look to see what you find. For example, um, this is the 1921 census record for the Hayward family from West Ham. We've gone from East to West Ham. And the family has actually enumerated their pets. Um, one Ginger Hayward, uh, a dog who is listed as working on her master's account, and then humorist Hayward, the tortoise, who comes from the Seychelles and whose occupation is eating slugs. So there's such a, a wonderful sense of love and humour here from James Hayward, the head of the household, who's filled out this form. Um, he's, he's a singing teacher and he's, he's um, written out these entries. He's actually taken the time to do that. Although officials have come along later and, and crossed out Ginger and Humorist. Uh, but, you know, we can still see them. They're still legible to us. And we've actually transcribed them here for you. So when you look at that household transcript, they're listed alongside um, James and, and his family. And yeah, I've pulled out some more examples from the 1921 census. And uh, on, on the left is a form for the Anderson family. And um, it, the Anderson family, they're from Barking. And there's a little uh, tiny um, annotation down there. And, um, and it's quite hard to read, but it says, um, Huey the canary sleeps in the house. Um, so it, it's clear that then is now that people considered their pets to be as much their household, a part of their household as their children, you know, or whoever was staying in the house at the time of the census. And it is because Huey sleeps in the house um, that he fulfills that the condition of being in the house at the time of the census. You know, he, he, he fulfills that remit and he merits uh, his um, in, inclusion. Um, and um, as does we've got a, on, on the right hand side uh, in the Gray family, there's a little black kitten called Rosie, as well as 10 chickens. So these annotations are, are just magical and they give us such a sense of a connection that our ancestors had with their pets. And um, we've got um, we've got some love. For, we've got some love from the, the tortoise <laughs> from Pickles. So it's very good at eating, um, eating slugs and, um, and Kim is hoping to find a grandparent's tortoise in the 1951 and 1961 uh, census records when uh, they, re they are released. So fingers crossed. Um, so uh, newspapers, <laughs> um, where else can you find pets on From My Past? And pets come up in our newspapers quite a lot. Mm. So, um, so I, I, I've been doing a bit of research into, into pets in um, our newspapers and actually I put, a, put together a little blog for our sister site, the British Newspaper Archive, and this one focuses on um, extraordinary cat tales from the archive. So um, if Jen could be kind enough to, to post that, uh, the link to that one, you can enjoy some, some intriguing cat tales um, from the archive, so from, from the newspaper collection. Um, so searching in our newspaper collection with terms like extraordinary cat or, or brave dog can, can unravel many, um, many stories about pets and their owners. And sometimes you might even find some photographs and drawings, perhaps even like this one. And this, this one, this is unraveled a whole can of worms. So I thought this, this um, drawing was illustrated um, entertaining enough, but there, there's a lot going on behind this image. So let, let's dive in, okay? <laughs> so this this particular uh, illustration um, comes from the Illustrated Police News. It was published in 1895. Caption: Cats in Court. And yeah, things things are going to get a bit wild, but let, 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 let's let's go back to 1895. Um, the Illustrated Police News provides these wonderful illustrations, but also they do give quite, the newspaper does give quite thorough accounts of trials. So in the account, um, we learned that there was a case heard in Bloomsbury County Court. Um, and the, it was a case of the Illustrated Police News dubbed as an amusing one. 
Now, the plaintiff was one Miss Ursula Cockburn Dickinson. Now, I think um, she's the, the figure in the centre. So we can sort of see the judge um, and uh, the jury and another woman. And I believe Ursula to be the lady depicted in the middle. Right. Ursula was a collector of Persian cats and she had arranged to purchase one from Mrs. Sarah Clements. So I think Mrs. Clements is the sort of quite um, scary lady, <laughs> scary looking lady on the right hand side. And um, Mrs. Clements was going to sell the cat to Ursula for two pounds and two shillings. So so that is that is not an inconsiderable sum there. And now Ursula wanted the cat to be a companion for her own cat. Queen Mary. Now, something must have told Ursula that all was not as it seemed about Mrs. Clements's cat. But to allay Ursula's fears, Mrs. Clements sent her a clipping of the cat's fur as proof of its breed. Satisfied, Ursula sent the money and Mrs. Clements sent her the cat. But the cat proved to be, and I quote, an ordinary London tomcat, best kind of cat, that's my cat lurking around wherever he is. Um, and Ursula uh, wanted her money back. And Mrs. Clements refused to give her the money back. And so the case ended up in court. And it is illustrated here um, by the police, Illustrated Police News. Now, um, the judge in, actually sided with Ursula. And the judgment was greeted with applause by the crowd and the greatly amused court. So I'm not sure what happened to the poor Tom cat at the centre of this, but I'm imagining he is um, one of the trio of cats that is shown here. So seeing about everybody's cats and what they're up to. <laughs> Um, I love this from Rosie. Um, my, reg my cat regularly posts comments on here in the forum. I only puts about paws on the keyboard while eating his cat's treats. <laughs> Oh, okay, we did have Panda, my cat, interrupt one of our sessions um, a few months back. Okay, so I, I got intrigued by Ursula and I wanted to find out more. And, you know, it's, it's a sort of luck of the draw when you see these, these interesting uh, illustrations. Um, you know, we're quite lucky because Ursula's name is fairly unusual in this case, Ursula uh, Cockburn Dickinson. So I, I kind of felt that I would find out more about her in our newspaper collection. And I was not disappointed. Um, so only a year after the cats were in court um, with Ursula, her name hit the pages of the press again under the headline, An Heiress Missing. So there's ever a more compelling headline. I don't know. Um, so we even get to see a photograph of Ursula and she is shown here on the left and left hand side from one of our illustrated titles, Black and White. So it turns out that um, Ursula was fairly wealthy, I suppose, as, as a collector of Persian cats. Um, she, she had to be a lady of some means. Um, and in September 1986, she went missing. And it is animals that are really at the heart of this case. So some background. Uh, we learned from Black and White that Ursula was the niece of Lord Laundersborough and a daughter of the Reverend George Cockburn Dickinson. So she, she, she is a member of the aristocracy. And we also learned that she has long amused herself with the keeping of pedigree cats. And so it was through this interest in seeking medical attention for one of her valuable pets, I quote, that she met one Reuben Schofield, um, who came from Hawley in Surrey. And Reuben was a chemist and a cat and dog fancier. So Reuben and Ursula bonded over their shared love of pets, and the newspaper tells us that a friendship of the most extraordinary nature appears to have sprung up between Miss Dickinson and this man. So I should also add that at this time, Ursula was about 27. So she's, she's actually um, a young woman. Um, now, she proposed to become a partner in her new friend Showfield's venture. Um, so um, he planned to open a cat and dog hospital in Tooting. But in September 1896, Ursula dis dis disappeared. And we can see an article on the, the right hand side from the Driffield Times that um, she was set to inherit £40,000, that she lived with her father at Longesborough Lodge in Worcester Park, Surrey. 
but she disappeared. Her heartbroken father uh, made inquiries at Brighton and with the Cardiff police. It doesn't say why those locations, but nothing. There was, there was no trace of her. She had sold, sold her investments. She'd sold gifts. She'd taken out money from the bank and she ran away with about £22,000. It was her own money, but £22,000. So that, that's a lot of money um, back then. Um, I, I think it's about, about £2 million. So it, it, it's not an inconsiderable sum. And a few weeks later, in October 1896, Ursula is still missing, and her illustration this time, an illustration of her, appears in the Harborn Herald. So by this time, it's understood that she has run away with a married man and fellow animal lover, Reuben Schofield, um, and Schofield has actually written a letter expressing that intention. And no trace of her by October had yet been found. And this is what I found quite remarkable in this case. Um, maybe we can crack it. Perhaps we can crack it. Um, so much uh, appears in the press about um, Ursula um, going missing. But after that, in after that, 1896, there's nothing. So if she ever was found, I can't find that it was reported on in the press. So for all intents and purposes, Ursula is still missing. So, I, but I, you know, that's a challenge for us in this community, isn't it? Um, perhaps we can find her. Um, but yeah, I mentioned her her unusual name, um, and this again, it, it might it, it throws a spanner into the works and trying to find her. Um, by 1895, 1896, she was going as Ursula, um, but we can see her baptism record for 1872, and this is from our Lincolnshire baptism collection. So her full name is Edith Jane Catherine Christophine Ursula. Dickinson. <laughs> Something of a mouthful. So I feel like she could have been going by either one of these names. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll see that she was she was going by Christophine at, at some point. Um, and yeah, I decided to look into her background a little bit more. And I am really quite minded to turn this into a novel. It, 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 yeah. It is fascinating. Um, yeah, and I've, I've seriously gone down the rabbit hole here. Uh, so yeah, the, the top left article shows the marriage of her parents uh, in 1870. That's from the Otley News. Um, Otley News, yeah, of the Otley News. And it um, it was her mother, Ursula Elizabeth Dennison, who had those aristocratic ties. She was the third daughter of the late uh, Lord Londesborough and stepdaughter of the Lord Otho Fitzgerald, control of Her Majesty's household. So some some connections there. But tragically, uh, Ursula Senior died at the young age of thirty one, and we can see her obituary uh, from brief from May eighteen eighty. So just a decade after her marriage, and I wonder whether this is uh, why uh, Ursula Junior decided to take her mother's name uh, rather than going by Edith or, or Christophine. Um, but all was um, really not quite well in the Dickinson household. Um, oh, we've got a question from Cam there. Can I watch this later when I get home from work? Yes, 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 you can. You can do. You can do. Just come back. Come back to the Facebook page, and you'll be able to find it and, and watch it again. Um, so yeah. All was not well within the Dickinson household. Uh, in 1892, the family hit the headlines uh, the Jew from the Jewsbury Chronicle, just there on the right-hand side. And the headline is, um, a vicar's children disguise themselves and provoke a row. Um, so, Londesborough Cockburn Dickinson, one of uh, Ursula's brothers, and his sister, whose name is given as Christophine, but I think this is probably our Ursula, um, Christophine was one of the many names that she was baptised with. They were summoned before the Huntingdonshire magistrates charged with having assaulted a labourer named Childs. Like, this is just reads like something, I don't know, out of fiction, I suppose, out of a novel. So Christophine and her brother had gone to a Baptist chapel in Hartford in a ludicrous disguise, having been recognised as, as, you know, the son and daughter of, of the local vicar, a scene of great disorder ensued with uh, Londesborough and Christophine being targeted with stones so that stones are being thrown at them their father the reverend turns up there's something of a, a confrontation and then allegations were made that he and his children assaulted child so 
and sort of members of the aristocracy here are behaving very badly. Um, and it, it really does sound like Ursula or, or Christophine had a very sort of turbulent and even violent childhood. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking that her, her love of cats provided quite a, a welcome distraction for her. And Oh, gosh, I don't want to really go into detail, but in 1893, there are some really shocking reports that reached the press about her father um, and um, uh, abuse allegations that he he had actually abused one of his sons. Um, so I, I just think it's it's very little wonder that poor Ursula uh, ran, a, ran away and she sort of stirred, stirred herself into her love of, of cats and I think bless her she she was she was lucky um to have the resources um to get away from what sounds like quite an unpleasant home life there but but on to lighter things on to lighter things um just a few more photographs that I that I pulled out um from our newspaper collection um and these are some of the extraordinary cats um uh, that we have featured and we've got um on the on the left hand side we've got Jim the cat he was featured by the Tatler in August 1903 and he was featured for his extraordinary bravery so his um his master uh Mr G Bailey he was asleep one night at uh, the pub that he ran uh outside just outside of Woking and he was fast asleep and he was woken up to and I'm sure uh, the many cat lovers, well, cat owners will recognise this cat pouring at him, meowing. And no, he, the cat wasn't hungry. Uh, he was waking him up because there was a fire. Um, the pub was on fire and um, Jim had woken up his owner who managed to raise the alarm and get everybody out of the pub. So uh, Jim was, yeah, Jim saved lives. So it's wonderful and definitely merits his inclusion there in the Tatler. And then, um, yes, <laughs> Anya and Jenna's already seen um, the cat's called Panda too. I had to, I had to pull out Panda because of my own cat being named Panda. So this is the, this is a lovely Panda um, cat from 1941, and he was featured in the Daily Mirror. Um, so at the height of the Second World War, this was a lovely sort of feel-good story that the newspaper featured about Panda, and um, the newspaper actually dubbed him. Um, uh, England's most travelled cat and basically he would happily travel and with his owner Alice Edmund um, from her home in Wiltshire to her place of work in Newbury, Berkshire so he, he used to go along um, with a lead um, so I think he was quite ahead of his time there and you know station staff had got used to used to Panda um, in his lead and Panda would know when it was time to travel um, he'd, he'd go and he'd go and get his lead ready uh, for his owner Alice and bring it with him down the stairs and there he is and um, peeking outside of a, a railway carriage um, I just quickly wanted to have a look at if I could find out more about Panda's owner um, Alice and I think it just just using this as an example um, and I'm sure we don't need to be told this but newspapers aren't always right uh, <laughs> and you can't always believe what we find in the press because I searched high and low for an Alice Edmund um, who, who fit the bill and um, also included in that same article is a picture of Alice and um, we can see that she's a woman of sort of roughly middle age so I had a sort of an idea of how old she should be but no one was really fitting the bill and I had the locations of Newbury and Berkshire and um, uh, Wiltshire I still couldn't find her until I mix it up a bit and then search for Alice Edmonds not Edmund um so the newspaper had incorrectly given you know they'd given the wrong name Ooh. Um, so here she is in the 1939 register, so just a couple of years before she appeared in the press um, with her birth year of 1890, and she was living in Willsford in Wiltshire and her occupation as a county council school teacher. So yeah, that, that was her job in Newbury. She was working at, as a school teacher. So that is our Alice there. And um, yeah, below that on the left-hand side is the census record for 1901. Um, she's living in Newbury. So again, that Newbury connection and is one of four sisters. The newspaper article mentions a sister. So um, she, she had a few. And I just I just wanted that. I love it when you see like a slightly unusual profession. One of her sisters was a photographic artist, which is just divine. Um, so Alice Edmonds passed away in 1981 at the grand old age of 91. So hopefully she had wonderful, one, many wonderful pets, um, just like Panda. Uh, so uh, not only, ooh, where am I? Oh, yes. And while we're on pets, um, it would be remiss of me uh, not to mention our, um, our 
our the wonderful animals that are featured in our um, Bella Zola Life in the Mirror series of photographs. Um, so this this joined our collection of Find My Past photographs a month or so ago, and um, this I love this collection. It was actually um, one of the first uh, collections that I helped to, to license um, for um, Find My Past. So I'm very proud of it, and it has some wonderfully um, evocative scenes of uh, daily life in the 1950s, um, including this wonderful picture of uh, British bulldog Henry and his owner Winifred Jones of Seaburn and um, yeah Jen thank you I um, just posted uh, the link in there to the um, the photo collection and absolutely you, you can just you can just uh, go through these, these for hours they are wonderful um, so yeah if you navigate to the photograph collection there we've got the link um, or you can also find it by searching via all records and once there I suggest um, typing animals in as your subject. Um, so this is a, a new subject that has been added to this collection with these Balazola photographs. So it will uh, surface um, pictures of animals in that collection. Or uh, alternatively, you can pop a keyword uh, into our keywords box so like dog or you know cat and you know it will surface it that way um but i've chosen to use animals uh, the animal subject to surface uh relevant photos through the bella solar collection and um, so not only do you get the the wonderful pictures like this one you see on the left you get lots of um a company information. So these photos would have appeared in a, a daily mirror spread called called Life in the Mirror uh, with a description. Um, and the description here, um, I love it. It says, in a landscape full of lampposts which should delight any dog's heart is Henry, a British bulldog, taking home a loaf of bread. He is pulling Mrs. Winifred Allison Jones, who is pushing the pram along the seafront at Seaburn. And I have to admit, I thought it was, I couldn't quite make it out what he was carrying. Um, I thought it was maybe a brick, but that seemed very unlikely. So it's, it's a loaf of bread. Um, so we, you know, this is great because we get the name of Henry's owner uh, and the date, uh, which is the 27th of April, 1954. Just love to know who the baby in the brown was. That would be wonderful if we could track them down. Um, and yet you also get the keywords there, like I mentioned. So on, on the transcript, you can, um, you can, you can search or dog or bulldog and that will return this image for you and I'm glad I'm not the only one on this um I thought it was a brick too yeah <laughs> and I'm just going to show you a few more of the wonderful animals to be found uh, in the Bellazola Life in the Mirror collections um on the left is uh, the the parrot from Brixton Market and on the right are a couple of dogs um lounging at the um, White Cross Hotel in Richmond so a lovely view of uh, Richmond Bridge there and, and the Thames um so again these but these are sort of these are scenes from daily life um so pets like the ones back in 1921 that were walking all over the censuses very much um at the heart of um our experience and Maz makes an excellent point I'm not sure I'd fancy bread that being in the bulldog's mouth yeah if it was wrapped up it didn't look like it was wrapped up did it this is this is alarming um yeah William yeah maybe the reporter told everyone is bread and um, yeah we have sort of seen that we can't we you know we can't trust everything that we read in the press and if our consensus does seem to be it's a brick <laughs> um so um there's some, some more pictures here of the the dogs from the the white cross hotel um in richmond and um they are with uh, their owner, Mrs. Dorothy Crispin, who was the landlady. And uh, in the accompanying information for this photograph, uh, we learn that the dog's owner's name was Dorothy Crispin. And uh, I had to look in our um, newspaper uh, collection and uh, we, we can see that uh, Dorothy had been the landlady of the White Cross um, in Richmond since at least February 1944. Uh, there's an article here from the Richmond Herald, which details her charitable efforts in aid of the licensed victualist the benevolent institution. Um, she had organized a dance uh, at a local restaurant for 250 people. And I'm just getting slightly sidetracked here, but uh, there's a pub, there's another uh, landlady listed here, Mrs. F.P. Muller of the Angel and Crown in Church Court, Richmond. And the Angel and Crown, um, that was actually run by my grandparents in the 1950s and 1960s. It's actually where my mum grew up. Um, so it's quite uh, special to see that that mentioned there. So um, Mrs. F.P. Muller uh, is one of their predecessors. So this collection, the Bella Zola collection, um, it is it's wonderful for adding sort of context to our historic records, but then it's quite reciprocal 
cool uh, relationship because then our, our other records can add more context to these photographs as well. And you can see here um, on the left uh, a photograph from our uh, other photographic collection, which is the, the Francis Fifth collection. And this photo comes all the way back from 1890. And I don't know um, if anybody's sort of familiar with that that area um, uh, of Richmond, but it had doesn't it doesn't seem to it hasn't changed much um and then i found this snippet from bell's life in london uh, one of our newspapers from august 1850 so a long while back and there's a small paragraph there in the middle about the white cross tavern in richmond which is close to the river um, so parties and visitors to this delightful place are informed that the above house is open with every accommodation for large or small parties so it's, it's good to know and I, I thought I'd end today with this delightful picture. I love this one so much. It's a real favourite um, of this collection. And it shows uh, Rubina Jenkins of Cardiff taking her dogs Pedro and Sandy out in a pram for the 1st of May 1954. Oh, sorry, 1st of March 1954. It's wonderfully eccentric. Um, you see the child there, um, you know, taking a peek at what is going on. And it's just so atmospheric too like the more you look at this photograph the more details you see that the shop names and you can you know there's the angel hotel there and the trees and the old cars um it, it is it's really it's really wonderful and again this is another instance of newspapers lying i think we I think we've established that by <laughs> by now and um our dog loving rabina is described as mrs rabina jenkins of Pearsville place in cardiff um so I managed to find uh, a Robina Jenkins living at Pearsville Place in Cardiff in 1939 uh, from the 1939 register. But she's not married. Um, fake news. Um, she she was she was single um, and she was born in 1907 and she's working as a nurse uh, living with her father, Reese and her sister, Gladys. And she also appears um, twice on the 1939 register, which is, which is something that you, you will see this. Um, the 1939 register was a, a living document. Um, it was used for the establishment of the NHS and updated well into the 1990s. So if there was more information to add to a person, and they couldn't, you know, you couldn't fit it in that original entry. They they make another one. So that's what's happened here with Rabina. And what I just found curious about the second entry was the um the quote marks around her name. Um, and you can see that um in, in the below image. So the, the top image there shows uh the the original entry and then the second entry, and then again I've just enlarged that um. Uh, just to highlight, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was unusual that we, we had the quote marks there, but I think, um, I think on conclusion, there wasn't a, a reason that I could find for the, those quote marks. Um, perhaps the person who was making the entry thought it was a curious name. And initially I couldn't find a birth record for Robina. So I did sort of sense oh, what's going on here. Um, but I did find her with her father, Reese, and her sister, Laura, in the 1921 census. Uh, and the reason why I couldn't find her birth record initially um, was that she was born in, in Motherwell in Scotland. Um, so I, I was looking for in the England records. And I think the family probably moved around a bit. Her father, Reese, was born in Hartlepool. Um, he was a steel worker. So I'm imagining that he moved around a bit with his job. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit more um, background to Rabina Jenkins and her dogs. Uh, I really hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this glimpse into uh, pet history and what it can help us to learn about our ancestors. Um, so I really hope you all have a lovely weekend. It's been a real pleasure um, talking with you today. I always look forward to our sessions. Um, so be sure to join us uh, next week and I will see you all very soon. All right, take care.